Thanks for downloading the Garden Fork Radio Podcast. If this is your first time here, Garden Fork is an eclectic mix of how-to, maker, DIY, cooking and gardening, and other cool stuff. Uh, I kind of have a very eclectic brain. It runs constantly with ideas to make videos about. And Garden Fork Radio is the audio companion to our YouTube channel and our website. You can find more about us at youtube.com slash gardenfork and at gardenfork.tv, our website. Today, I have my friend Sherry on. She also has a YouTube channel, and that's where I met her. Um, she made a comment on one of my videos. It's flannelacres.com is her website, and her YouTube channel is also called Flannel Acres. It's very garden forky. Uh, she lives in Michigan, and it's kind of home, pro- you know, home projects. She does some neat canning stuff recently we're going to talk about, some backyard stuff as well, and she's a beekeeper. So, here we go. So, hey, Sherry, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. So, how, how did we meet? Did you, I think you made a comment on the Garden Fork YouTube channel, and I realized that you were a beekeeper and did stuff kind of similar to what I did. Yeah, I had watched your videos for a while and made some comments here and there, so just kind of from that, I guess. And your YouTube channel is called Flannel Acres. Yep, that's right. Which I like because I was like, oh, I wear flannel shirts too. So, <laughs> Yeah, I have a bunch of them. I wear them all the time. You're wearing one right now, right? I am, yep. <laughs> On the podcast, we can't see that, but I can attest to that she's wearing flannel. Yep, it's, it's a flannel kind of day. What part of the country are you in? We are in West Michigan. Oh, excellent. I grew up in Wisconsin, you know. Okay, yep, right by the big lake. Yeah. So I was in, um, I was uh, bes- between uh, Milwaukee and Waukesha. Uh, we made it, we went to the Upper Peninsula, but not to uh, Michigan, the bigger part usually. Okay. Yep. But similar kind of mindset. A lot of Garden Fork people are in the Midwest. It's just kind of a, there's this common m- mindset and a light bulb goes off when people see the show and it's kind of like they're doing the same kind of thing. So yeah, it's all familiar stuff. Yep. I was curious what, um, why was it that you started a YouTube channel? Um, part of it was, well, I started a blog a few years ago about crockpot cooking because I'd posted several things on Facebook um, about crockpot things that I was doing. And my friend said, well, you ought to start a blog. So I started a, a separate blog on that. Um, and then after I started watching YouTube videos and really got into that, I thought, well, if I can blog about it, I can probably do videos about it. So um, watching your channel and other channels kind of similar to yours, I thought, well, if they can, you know, put out stuff like this, that's um, interesting and, you know, kind of common everyday stuff sometimes, um, why not try it? So that's pretty much how I got into it. I just gave it a shot. (laughs) Yeah, the hardest part is just starting it. So yeah, and having the confidence to actually put yourself out there a little bit. Did you, did you find you had that confidence right away or was it kind of awkward for you to just kind of be talking to the camera or? Very awkward. Yeah, I would say very awkward. Um, I'm not one that really enjoys talking in front of people and in front of a camera, it's a little bit different, but you kind of know that you're talking to people through the camera. So, um, yeah, kind of a little bit of pressure there, but I, I can say I'm getting used to it. Um, I still get a little bit nervous about that kind of thing, but, um, yeah, it's getting better. I'm having fun with it though. I found that, um. Like with, for the podcast, I kind of like interviewing people remotely. I don't like to do it in person because it just seems more comfortable for me. Yeah. You fear the awkward pause, I think. I do anyway. There's one right there. <laughs> 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 All right. So I kind of look to you as this uh, backyard expert in a couple of things. And you just made a video about canning grapes. And I would have never have thought to do that. And it was like this light bulb. I was like, well, how cool is that? Yeah, I get a lot of comments on the canning grapes thing. Um, a couple of years ago, I taught a cla- a canning class at our local, um, what do you call it, the like community ed program. Yep. Um, and that was what I taught them to do, you know, as an example on how to can is canning grapes. And people always say, oh, I never thought you could can grapes. And what are they like? And um, it's just something that my mom canned when I was a kid. So it was a, a familiar thing to me and very easy to do. So it just came up as, you know, well, why don't I teach people how to do that? It's easy and cheap. Is the the liquid that you're canning in, is that a sugar-based liquid? 
Yeah, it's a sugar syrup, and I'm I can't remember the exact proportions offhand, but it's it's a lighter syrup. I prefer to can with a lighter syrup as opposed to a heavy syrup when I do fruit. Yep. What I noticed the comment you made was the canned grapes after being going through the canning process taste a little bit like the grapes and fruit cocktail, and that evoked a childhood memory for me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty much just like that. Yep. And my mom would put those into little popsicle molds for us kids, you know, the grapes and the juice into there. And th those were our popsicles when we were kids. Probably a lot healthier than what they have now in the grocery store. Probably, yep. <laughs> what I thought was neat was I, I've done some canning videos and I get what I call the, uh, the canning political correctness police after me on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That I didn't do this right or that right. And I have always thought it's a waste of time to boil the the lids with the rub with the seal in them, yeah. and then and then what what was your epiphany in your latest video there? I had picked up on an article or something that came through the Ball Canning Company um, that they did a little bit of research on it, and they determined that you don't need to heat up your lids beforehand. So I quit doing it. <laughs> why Why do that extra step if you don't have to? Because yeah, I guess the, the idea was that it would be um, uh, sterilizing the the mason jar lid or, the, you know, the ball jar lid. Right. But I was like, but it, it gets wicked hot in the canner, in the hot water bath canner anyway. So mm -hmm. why do you need to sterilize it before? I don't know. That's just I so I was in completely right. in agreement with you, and I was kind of that was kind of neat that Ball came out and said that. Yeah, and when my mom was was canning when I was a kid, I think she told me that it would soften the rubber on the seal a little bit, which would make it seal better. But the other thing that I thought of too was um, when she would can jams, she would a lot of times, um, you know, put the jam into the jar, and then she'd pour a layer of paraffin wax on that, and then put the lid and ring on it. So. I guess if she were to heat the lids before that, that would help seal the jar then. Um, but I don't think she put those into the canner. I don't remember. I just remember the layer of wax on there. I remember the wax. Actually, there's. I do know one woman that uh, that I still get um, sometimes a little jam with, and she uses the wax. She's like really old school like that. Uh huh. The other thing I was wondering is. Um, the actual heating up of the jars, I heat them in the microwave. Is that okay? I would think so. I've heard that it's best to use moist heat when you're heating up your jars. Um, I've done it in the dishwasher, just run a rinse cycle with just jars in there. Yeah. And then keep it closed until I'm ready to use them. Um, so that works too. And depending on what, on what I'm canning, sometimes I'll do that and sometimes I won't. Um, if I'm putting stuff in the jars that is cold, like when I process... Um, venison that goes into the jars cold so if i heat up the jars and i put cold meat in there it's going to cool them down anyway so i skip it for that but i was wondering whether heating the jars just helped when you're dropping them into the hot water bath mm -hmm. causing them to maybe crack less you know yeah that's what i've heard too and and i'm sure that helps with some things but when i do the pressure canning you're putting it into you're not submersing the jars so it is probably it heats up more gradually i guess doing it that way yep as opposed to putting them in the hot water bath canner. With the, I've never done the pressure canning, but I've seen a couple of pressure cookers that double as a pressure canner. What are you using? I have a pressure canner. Um, I do have the, you know, the booklet that comes with it has recipes where I can do some cooking in it, but it's so big, it's a little bit awkward to cook, you know, a, a small recipe in such a huge thing. Um, but I can do both in mine. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that, and I was like, you know, you'd have to have a giant pork shoulder or a giant piece of brisket to put in a canner like that. Yeah. <laughs> it seems to me I did cook a roast in there once when I first got it, and it worked well. Yeah. Um, but it, it took a while for it to come up to pressure because it's such a big canner. So. so for the pressure canning, you're doing venison. Are you doing other meats as well? Um, the only meat that I've done is venison. Um, I've done cubed venison and ground venison in the pressure canner, but I've also done like stew and I do, um, like turkey and chicken stock. Anytime I buy a, a turkey on sale, um, you know, I make stock from that and, and can that too. So yeah, we do stuff like green beans and, you know, low acid veggies like that. When you're doing meats, uh, I basically in the pressure canner, it's cooking the meat, right? 
Yeah, um, some people will cook the meat before they put it into the jars. I don't because it's another step I feel like you don't have to do. Yeah. Um, I just, most of the time I cube up the meat into like half inch cubes and then just stuff it into the jar with a little bit of salt and then put the lid on. You don't even have to put any water in there because there will be meat juices in there. Right. Um, so, but some people will pre-cook the meat and then put it in the jar with some juice or water, you know, that kind of thing in there. All right, cool. I noticed in your latest video you also have a, uh, it's called a foods, it's a vacuum sealer. It's the, uh, it's the consumer version of a, uh, a vacuum bag sealer unit. And my neighbor just gave me a used one for free, so I'm kind of excited about this. Oh, yeah, those are really great. We just got ours, um, I think it was about a year ago, year and a half ago. Um, and I used it to pack up some venison when we got some deer meat and that worked really great in the plastic bags that you get you know kind of on a roll yeah yep yeah. with that um so that worked really well for freezing the meat and then i also got the attachments that you can put on the tops of mason jars there's a regular size one and a, and a wide mouth um, huh. size one and it has a tube that attaches to the unit and you can vacuum seal you know dried foods in the jars too Oh, how cool. I was what I liked it for <laughs> because I'm like the urban urban guy here is I go to the uh, the I, what I call the wholesale grocery store like a Costco or a BJ's or whatever. Uh-huh. And it's only me and my wife and the dogs, but I'll buy this big thing of blue cheese and it's like half a half a round of blue cheese and it never lasts in the fridge and I in cooking magazines I've seen that you can if you double wrap it in plastic wrap it'll keep forever and it really doesn't so the first thing that i shrink wrapped was i took uh this half a wheel blue cheese and sliced it into triangles and i shrink wrapped it with the machine uh -huh. and it's brilliant for that oh nice see you learned something today yeah i did <laughs> <laughs> i think yeah. just it's kind of a neat device to keep air from getting near your food yeah definitely and i i wonder too um there was i vacuum sealed a jar of green beans that I had dried and the seal keeps releasing on that. So I don't know if there's something that I didn't do right with those beans. Maybe they're not totally dry and there's gases releasing from them. Right. Or they're off gassing. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to watch out for stuff like that too, I guess. I did meet a guy in line the other day at the warehouse store and he was buying a, a, a replacement roll of the shrink wrap. I call it just the shrink wrap bags. Uh -huh. And I said, oh, you got one of those uh, food saver things. He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, I, uh, I shrink wrap all my canned food. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, so he puts the cans in the bags and. and yeah. Up? Oh, wow. I didn't get that. But, you know, whatever makes you happy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag unnecessary. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you would consider becoming a monthly supporter of Garden Fork Radio and GardenFork.tv. Um, we've made it really easy to do so. We've started a Patreon campaign, and you choose a dollar amount every month that you would like to contribute to Garden Fork. Uh, the suggested dollar amount is $3 a month. That's less than a dollar a show, a buck a show, as Rick calls it. It's about $36 a year, so that's, that's like a magazine subscription, basically, is how I think about it. If you're interested, there's a link in the show notes here. If you're listening on an iPhone in the podcast app, just tap on the Garden Fork Radio logo of this episode, and it will show the show notes, and there's a link in there. Or go to patreon.com slash gardenfork. That's patreon.com slash gardenfork. There's also a link on every page of our website. If you consider that, that would be really cool. Appreciate that. You can also support Garden Fork by using our Amazon shopping link, which is on our website. You can also go to gardenfork.tv slash Amazon, and that, if the technology is working, should take you to Amazon as well. All right? Thank you. One of the other videos I like uh, of yours, and I'm blanking on the name of the video, but you're out in your yard and you're making um, these kind of doughy, doughy things over the campfire with a clamshell uh, cast iron cooker device. Oh, yeah. Hobo pies. All right. Yep. yep. Yeah, we did that um, on a camping trip that we went on this past summer, and um, we did lasagna in them, and it was really good. Um, I don't know what gave me the idea to do that. I can't remember anymore. 
but um, I just basically put together lasagna ingredients ahead of time and, you know, stuck that container in the cooler for the trip. And then when it came time to make them, we, instead of using just butter for the bread, uh, we mixed in some garlic. So the bread, like the crust, yep. um, tastes like garlic bread with hot, cheesy lasagna in the middle. It was really great. Good, good stuff. Plus the fact that you're just out in the woods makes it taste better. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cooking over the fire is is good in so many ways. Yeah. I want to do this thing, uh, of course, I read about in the New York Times, um, but it's a country thing, is cooking baked beans in a Dutch oven in the ground. You put a, a, like a charcoal wood fire in the ground, put huh. your Dutch oven of baked beans in there, cover it with dirt and let it sit all day. Oh, wow. That's kind of an old fashioned slow cooker method. Yeah, I figured I didn't want to dig a hole in my yard, so I would <laughs> dig a hole and I have raised garden beds and I thought that would work just as well. So. Oh, yeah, I would think it would. That's on. The, there's just so much to do and not, not enough time as far as every video. I've got a list a page and a half long of stuff I want to do. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They'll keep you busy for a while. <laughs> yeah. What, when you were um, basically starting out with the YouTube channel, what, what were you expecting? And then what after it started, what, what did you realize wasn't what you wanted and, and what came out that you did want to happen? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. Um, I was expecting that um, more people that I know personally would be on board with it. And I think that goes for a lot of things, a lot of endeavors that people try out. They expect that their closest friends and family would be on board and be their biggest fans, and that's not necessarily the case. Um, not that they are against what I'm doing, but um, you kind of find out that there are other people in this world that are a lot more gung-ho about what you're doing than sometimes the people you know close to you. So yep. that was kind of a surprise to me. Um, what was I expecting? Um, I didn't really know what to expect. I wasn't sure how people would react to what I'm doing and, um, if it would be well received or, you know, how many subscribers I would even get, you know, the first probably 20 subscribers I got, I was in shock. <laughs> <laughs> it's just this whole new concept to me. So, um, the channel's grown a bit and we're creeping up close to, a thousand subscribers, which seems huge to me. I know it's not huge in YouTube world, but um, it still continues to surprise me. Yeah, but you can have a community with a thousand people that's really nice, actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the comments that I get are always really nice. And um, even on Facebook, the people that comment on the Facebook page are nice. And yeah, it's, it's really cool to meet other people from all over the place and have common interests like that. Yeah, I've found that as the my subscriber numbers grow because they've they found a particular video that they like and not all the videos are going to be about plywood boats, you know. Mm -hmm. So I don't get a high view rate, but the people that do watch, um, I recognize their names now. Like there's a guy, Russ, from Texas, you know, and there's another guy named Will who has the Wisconsin uh, um, Country Homestead Project, you know, and stuff mm -hmm. like this. So it's just kind of neat. Um I found I, I get some haters out there, but it's just it's I haven't hit that level yet, which is quite nice, actually. <laughs> yeah. And that's one thing that I, I put in my head right away that, you know, once you get to a certain point, you're going to get people that are, you know, doing the thumbs down on your videos. You're going to get somebody who comments kind of you know negative on your stuff. So I know it's going to happen and it's happened a couple of times, but I'm not worried about it because you look at the YouTubers that have like a million subscribers and and they get negative stuff all the time it's it's just what happens i i made my i was trying to make one of my inspirational slice of life videos and we went to the ocean the other day mm -hmm. and i got some thumbs down on it i'm like what's wrong with dogs at the beach <laughs> <laughs> yeah i yeah i can't figure people out sometimes you just never know <laughs> oh well well let's move into the backyard what other kind of projects are you doing i know you have a garden there and you're in michigan so it's the winter coming but do you have some plans for any kind of hoop houses or anything early spring stuff i would love to put together some cold frame boxes it's something i wanted to do for a long time um i do have a video about growing greens i have a, a small area in the front yard along the front of the house where it's shady and it's it's kind of ideal for herbs and things like that um, and I'd like to shelter those so that I can maybe snitch a few during the winter um, and get a, you know, give them a head start in the spring. But I just haven't had the extra time to put those together yet. I, I think I can get my hands on the materials. But, um, yeah, I'd, I'd definitely like to do that. And I'd like to grow some garlic someday, but I never remember in the fall that I need to plant the stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe someday I'll remember to do that. 
But um, my garden in general this year kind of ran away from me. I started working more hours at my daytime job. Um, so it, I didn't get as much out of that as I probably should have or could have. But, um, you know, it's just one of those years. It got busy and I did get some things out of it. But I still got to get out there and, you know, till things under and get it ready for planting in the spring. So... I'm going, to cover, I'm going to cover all my raised beds with black plastic and just let the, let the mice and the worms take care of it this year. That's a good idea. I, um, I'll take chopped up leaves, the mulched leaves from the yard, and I'll lay that on the top, and I just put the black plastic on, which I use, I reuse every year. Okay. Um, yep. And there, yeah, there's some mice in there, and they make some little nests, but it's better there than in my house, you know? Exactly. <laughs> um, they can work in your garden for you. But that's like, because this year I injured my back, so I really... I was lucky that I could walk into the yard, let alone do some gardening. But I tell you, the raised bed makes it a lot easier when your mobility is limited. Oh, yeah, definitely. And that's something that we did for um, my husband's parents as a combined gift for Mother's Day and Father's Day. Um, they don't have really a spot for raised beds or a big garden anymore. They can't really do that um, because of their health. But what we did was we took a couple of five-gallon buckets and drilled some holes in the bottom and then put mulch and good you know manure and dirt and stuff in there and then I planted um, cucumbers tomatoes and what was the other thing I can't remember the other thing offhand but I, we planted these things for them right in these five gallon buckets and they tended to them all summer and picked the produce from them and it really worked out pretty well so that's another kind of a portable option too for raised bed gardens did you use a particular variety of cucumber tomato like a container one that's bred for containers or just what you got at the store yeah, I, I like to have the bush variety of pickle cucumbers, um, and I think the ones that I actually got this year were more of a vine, so they did kind of creep over the edges um, down onto their deck a bit, but that was okay. It didn't get out of hand or anything, but I like the smaller cucumbers, and I figured that would be good for them too, um, you know, the smaller produce. Yeah, it's it's kind of like, what do you do with that giant zucchini, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or those big watery cucumbers. My neighbor... Uh, grows so many cucumbers that you find them in the woods because he's tossed them in the woods. So, oh, yep. The Labradors have a big cucumber in their mouth. They're like, "Hey, look at this!" <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so, what's what's going what's going to go on in the future with uh, with your uh, yard projects and the YouTube channel? Um, I'm going to keep on doing what I'm doing um, as best as I can. Um, it's been a couple weeks since I've put out a video because of some major computer issues that we've had, but. Um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm looking for ideas around the house and, you know, just things that we're doing in the future and um, trying to figure out ways to get that on video and, you know, stuff about saving money around the house. Um, I have a, a video coming out soon. If I can get it online, it'll come out soon um, about cutting my own hair. And I've always done um, haircuts for our family. So that's that's a way to save money um, around the house. And um, yeah, just general stuff around here. I, I don't have, um, I do have a short list of things I want to get to, um, like using my beeswax to make some lotion bars. My family really likes those. Um, so yeah, we got to get a couple of beekeeping things out there too. And yep, just keeping on, keeping on. We didn't even touch on beekeeping, but that's kind of, I think where we connected was I watched some of your beekeeping videos. I was like, oh, neat. Yep. We've got a few hives this year and we did one split and it's doing okay. I'm not sure if they'll make it through the winter because their numbers just didn't come up that good. But um, yeah, we got some honey this year and we're <laughs> toying with the idea of getting more hives next spring um, just because people keep asking us for honey. I mean, we're, we're down to enough that we'll keep our family through the winter, but we keep getting people asking, you got honey, you got honey. So we need to do something about that. I think we, we definitely have customers rolling in for that. You could, you could combine the split again for winter. If you wanted. Yeah, I could. Um, I was reading a little bit about that. I haven't decided what I want to do yet. Um, I'll send you a link to this really neat website. It's called Honey Bee Sweet. Oh, yeah. I think I've heard of that one. Yeah. yeah she's great. And she has a couple articles about that because um, like both my hives this year are really good. But I didn't realize that last year I had a weak hive and I didn't think of it. But I was like, oh, I could I could combine it. And what also people are doing to geek out on beekeeping for everybody here is you can take two hives that are okay and you put a queen, ex you, you take the weak hive and stick it complete on top of the robust hive and put a queen excluder. 
So you have two hives functioning in one stack. Mm -hmm. And that actually helps them keep the hives warmer in the winter. Okay. So I thought that was, I have yet to do that, but that is another way to do things. So I think I've heard too where you can put newspaper in between them. And by the time they chew through it, they're all happy with each other and <laughs> they don't yes. fight. Yes. So. But you have to, you have, you'll have to remove one of the queens. Yeah. Yep. Definitely. Um, I've done that kind of newspaper split, uh, newspaper uh, reuniting, and it works really well. Um, oh, good. A couple of times I've had hives where the queen has just died, and I'm like, well, I don't have time to go get a new queen and do all this. So I just, I keep newspaper in my beekeeping kit, and you just stick uh, most of the boxes from that hive on top of an existing hive with newspaper between them, and they chew through it. And the bees are so fastidious that they remove all the newspaper from the hive. <laughs> And then when you take the hive apart again, you know, you've, some of the newspaper is stuck between the boxes and you can see this like looks like this little bee bite marks all around the perimeter there where they where they snipped off the newspaper. Huh, that's funny. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, cool. I just wanted to um, have you on the show. I know we've been kind of emailing and talking on um, personally, and I just wanted to share you with the Garden Fork listening audience. They're in their car right now. But the website is flannelacres.com, correct? Correct. Yep. And also Flannel Acres on YouTube there. So cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. This is fun. Well, we'll have you on again. We can talk about how to cut your hair because um, actually my <laughs> wife cuts my hair, but it's a crew cut. So it's pretty. Yep. <laughs> All right. Thanks again. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Not sure if you've reached your destination yet or are you on the treadmill? I hope you're on a treadmill or a bike or walking or something. Always great to hear from you guys. The email address is radio at gardenfork.tv. That's radio at gardenfork.tv. And always, if you're on iTunes on your computer, would you leave us a review? That really helps. All right. So make it a great day. I'll see you later. Garden Fork's theme music is used under license from uniquetracks.com. Mm-hmm.